I'm going to hand over the floor to give us the opening remarks to our representative from the Czech Presidency of the European Council, that is Ambassador Jaroslav Zajicek, Deputy Head of the Czech Permanent Representation to the EU. Thank you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Good, good morning, and thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. It doesn't happen too often. Uh, indeed, it's, uh, it is a great uh, privilege for me uh, to be part uh, of this. Uh, honestly, it's uh, personally uh, a good occasion for me to step aside for a moment from you know uh, preventing uh, energy crisis and uh, keeping us warm for the next winter. So, uh, with, with these comments, I wish to just briefly, uh, you know, say a couple of words uh, how the Czech presidency uh, sees uh, the very topical uh, issue that is uh, in hand. Where, where to start? Well, uh, I believe we all agree that it should be difficult to, to for a burglar to uh, get uh, into your house or for a criminal group to tap, tap your phone. But I guess uh, in the uh, cyber domain, these uh, events are too common. Uh, it's because we don't always lock uh, the door. Uh, and sometimes uh, when we do, uh, the padlock does not uh, work. So here we are. Uh, we, we're pretty sure that it shouldn't be this way. Uh, and cybersecurity is an integral part of our digital, digital future and uh, the way we see it, that it must never be uh, taken uh, as just an uh, afterthought. As you probably know, the, the Czech presidency uh, has cybersecurity quite high, flying in the priority uh, for the next three and a half months that we still uh, have. Uh, you might remember that the motto of the Czech presidency is uh, uh, Europe as a task, rethink, uh, rebuild, repower. Uh, and if you actually look uh, on the list of priorities, uh, the words of security and resilience are probably the most frequently used uh, word. So I believe that the title for today's uh, uh, conference or event is uh, very much coinciding with what the Czechs uh, are planning to do uh, for the next, uh, as I said, a couple of months till the end of the year. Now it is clear that the uh, current geopolitical uh, environment underscores uh, the, the readiness of some actors to risk and endanger international security. Uh, and stability. And while we have worked hard to strengthen uh, our critical networks uh, and systems against the most severe threats, we have sometimes overlooked, uh, let's be honest, uh, some simple things. And we forget that uh, we all, 450 million of us uh, in the EU, make up a resilient system and that in the cyberspace we are all connected. Uh, these connections enable us uh, to transcend ourselves, uh, and I want this to sound as a cliche, uh, and collaboratively to construct a better, better future. Uh, and these connections at the same time also make us vulnerable uh, since uh, the presidency truly believes that united we stand and together we fall. Some three specific remarks in this respect. Firstly, this is the reason uh, the Czech presidency has placed such an emphasis uh, since its start on the cybersecurity of EU institutions, bodies and agencies, IBA aiming at uh, reaching agreement, and that's the ambition that we have, uh, some kind of uh, outcome, a tangible outcome, at the uh, Council in November. Voila. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, both uh, member states and EU entities uh, simply must place cybersecurity uh, at the core uh, of our digital uh, transition. And it also helps uh, when you're a presidency that you're credible. Uh, now, uh, I believe, of course, we are quite active in agreeing uh, NIS 2. Before that, uh, I still remember that Czech Republic was uh, actually the first country to uh, transpose uh, NIS 1 directive, uh, and we are quite uh, proud of it. And I also believe that the National Cybersecurity Office uh, in Brno uh, belongs to the best uh, in, in Europe. Secondly, uh, this is the reason why we have open discussions on the supply chain uh, cybersecurity in the Council. Why? Uh, the, the resilience of the whole is uh, only as strong as the weakest link. That is quite, uh, quite clear. And this applies us throughout the digital value chain. And thirdly, this is also why we will now work very hard on making sure uh, that the Cyber Resilience Act is handled uh, with the priority it deserves. The Act has a potential for making the security uh, of a wide spectrum of uh, digital products on the internal market to another level. How? Number one with its wide scope and mandatory nature of requirements, uh, it aspires to improve security throughout the entire digital supply chain. Number two, it aspires to build trust in digital technologies and thus to enable a secure digital transition for all. And believe me, when you don't have trust uh, between the internal market and elsewhere, you cannot do much. 
Third, uh, in some ways, the act will be a trailblazer. This is uh, at least uh, what we hope it's going to be. Which uh, brings me to the second point. Uh, situated uh, within the new legislative framework, which is at the core of the proposal, the act should bring uh, cybersecurity considerations to complement safe product de development. And yet, uh, ensuring cybersecurity of a product is somewhat different to ensuring its safety. In cybersecurity, it is crucial not only to design and develop secure products, uh, but also to maintain them secure during the period of their usage. And it is therefore a must to have safeguards ensuring the digital products remain secure also after being delivered to the users. The focus of the proposed uh, Cyber Resilience Act or CRA or CRA, new uh, abbreviation that we'll need to deal with uh, in, in the next couple of weeks uh, and, and months, uh, places on secure development and security throughout the life cycle of a product uh, and will make sure citizens uh, in the EU can rely on resilient products. This is very important. And it will undoubtedly influence mainstreaming, mainstreaming of uh, security by design principles across the world. And so, we, uh, so as we improve uh, our resilience at home, uh, we will notice cascading effects uh, throughout the global digital uh, value chain. And uh, we will ensure that the connections uh, we make globally can benefit from the security we expect in our own house. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm, I'm very glad that it is during our presidency that we are able to embark on this, uh, what I would call, exciting journey. Uh, beginning to discover the constituent pieces of the cyber uh, puzzle, representing a common resilience framework uh, both in the EU and uh, beyond. With these comments, I wish you all a very successful event today, and I'm sure there will be a very fruitful exchange of views because the panelists are just perfect for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, indeed, highlighting some of the big concerns for the Czech presidency and for many of us. So uh, let's turn to our panelists. I'm very delighted to have joining us uh, someone who needs nearly no introduction, Lorena Box Alonso, who understands all things digital here in the European bubble, Director of Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity at GG Connect in the European Commission. Claudio Texiera is the Digital Rights Legal Officer at BEIRC, the European Consumer Organization, and is working on online platforms, telecommunications, cybersecurity, and of course, the Cyber Resilience Act. Dr. Joanna Zwartkowska is the Chief Operating Officer for the European Cyber Security Organization. And next to her, we have Gordon Gortev, who is the Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at BlackBerry. And last but not least, we have Shante Mario, who is Vice President and General Manager of Identity Management and Security at UL Solutions and is here representing the Global Association TIC Council. Now, there's a lot that has been set out in those opening remarks. There's a lot to get to through. Uh, it's only last Thursday that we got to see this, so there may be a lot of chewing and froing, and we need to see more detail and questions on about that. But Lorena, I'm going to hand over to you. Tell us about how far the work has come, what more needs to be done, and what are you hearing already in these short last few days? Okay, so you told me very short. I will be <laughs> <laughs> very short just to a bit uh, explain the logic of what's behind how right is the ambassador to say that this is going to make a difference. Uh, uh, I think that I don't need to quote uh, any figure of how m much cyber uh, attacks have increased. I mean, we have this in the, in the papers every day. Uh, but I think that something that has to be highlighted is that two-thirds of those come for the from the exploitation of vulnerabilities in connected devices. So, uh, and by the way, uh, the devices that are put on the market, uh, two-thirds of them have vulnerabilities, I mean, more than half known vulnerabilities, so that the producers are putting them knowingly with vulnerabilities. Now, uh, Obviously, then, the, the, the objective of the proposal is to reduce this surface of attacks. Uh, and we really believe that this can have an impact in the, in the number of, of cyber attacks that we are going to have. Now, uh, we had to come with a piece of legislation because currently the cost of all these attacks are, is being bared by the consumer, whether it's business or citizens, we bear the cost. So normally, it's not an incentive for a producer to produce it super cyber secure because, and logically, 
in this market. You need to put it as quickly as possible in the market. This is why we had to legislate. Now, I will not go into the details, just to say that this is not a revolution. Uh, we have been legislating on, on product safety, as correctly said by the ambassador, for many years. It's logical. We, nobody thinks today that there will be a product put on the market that is not safe, and this is why it has the C mark. Uh, but we had not, not updated this type of legislation to the 21st century, which is that connected yeah. products are there, and they need to be not only safe, but they need to be cyber secure. So this, this is what this is all about about putting it in the market for the moment. Let's see, and let the colleague shout at me. Uh, for the <laughs> moment, uh, the reactions are good, are positive. Uh, I think the market was prepared for mm. this. They were realizing that something had to happen, and it's better that it happens at EU level than that it happens in a fragmented way. So this is it mm -hmm. right now. Happy to continue afterwards. Right, well, let, let's turn, Claudio, to you. And obviously, the consumer organization, you've looked at connected devices. I know a lot of the years, I remember your colleagues bringing this Kayla doll to so many conferences to show us how easily it could be uh, exploited. There's a big difference between the Consumer Products Act and something like the NIS directive, which is more about critical infrastructure. Give me your perspective on how far the Cyber Resilience Act goes. Hey, thanks, Jan. On behalf of the European Consumer Organization, glad to be here. And uh, uh, funny you mentioned Kayla. I actually brought it, but uh, she was barred at the door. You know, she was uh, considered too cyber unsafe to <laughs> manage to this uh, conference. Um, from from our perspective, this is indeed a very, very you know important uh, piece of legislation. This is a, a very, very important proposal, and it is indeed for us uh, an answer to what has been um, a long-standing demand by consumer organizations, namely Bilk, who has been at the forefront of this. Um, issue for quite some time, noting that indeed uh, we do have a, a significant issue uh, with, uh, with these products, with connected devices. We do have a significant uh, issue when it comes to cyber vulnerabilities. And uh, indeed we needed uh, a framework, uh, a common framework to be introduced precisely to regulate uh, this problem. And so we welcome the, the move of the Commission to do so. It, this is very, very much welcome from our side. And, um, and indeed, um, it does address for us, which is one of our main key issues, which is the fact that cyber resilience starts with products being uh, cyber secure by design and by default. The idea that manufacturers should be indeed responsible for ensuring that uh, the products are placed on the market only when they know that the vulnerabilities have been addressed. It is super important, but also the issue of uh, what you call continued conformity meaning that it's not just about of, uh, hitting the ground running and placing the products on the market uh, cyber secure. It's also the fact that we need to continue to ensure that they remain so during the expected life cycle of the products. And uh, until now, this is something that was lacking, so we, we indeed do welcome. Um, however, of course, like all proposals, um, there, is, uh, there is room for improvement. And, uh, and on our cases, the, not going too much into detail, I mean, especially when it comes to consumer redress, when it comes to the particular products which are to be considered critical. Now, there's still some substantial room for improvement, of course, but uh, um, from the initial pers consumer perspective, this is indeed a very positive, positive outcome. Joanna, your perspective um, on, on what you've seen so far, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for providing EXO with the opportunity to contribute to this extremely important and uh, timely discussion. And of course, today I, I do represent EXO and I will be speaking on behalf of the organization, but I would like to start with a few remarks of a more personal nature. Uh, because prior to joining EXO, I worked at uh, one of the largest investment and wealth management banks um, uh, on earth, and I was uh, I played the role of the director within the team responsible for managing cybersecurity risks stemming from external dependencies. And based on that, that experience, I can uh, say with the full conviction that securing supply chain is absolutely fundamental to our societal, economical, uh, and, and political well-being. So with that, uh, and personally, I was amazed that for so many years, we as a society, we sort of accepted uh, the market being full of not necessarily um, a secure products that we relied upon, that we integrated within our system, so on and so forth. So with that, I think that the proposal on the Cyber Resiliency Act is extremely important, and this is a huge step forward. 
Now, putting back my uh, EXO hat, um, uh, basically our organization warmly welcomes uh, the CRA. We do believe that this is a mechanism that can significantly boost uh, cybersecurity posture of the of the European Union and the, and the entities um, that constitute the Union. Uh, we also believe, and I would say that this is equally important, that this can be a mechanism that will boost the cybersecurity market. And due to the many reasons, one of which is the fact that it will, it will increase the uh, transparency. So basically, the user will understand what they are buying, what they can expe ex expect out of the, out of the products. Um, it will promote those entities that actually do care about cybersecurity th these days. And, and that is uh, also very important because for uh, many European companies also being uh, EXO members, actually cybersecurity is treated as a competitive uh, advantage. And I think that this is one another dimension that is worth to be mentioned. Uh, all, 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 uh, saying that all, I, I, I do want to underline once again that for EXO, Cyber Resiliency Act is extremely important piece of legislation. We are still looking into the details, of course. For us, it's going to be super important, and that is mm, very highlighted by our members that we want to see harmonization with the with the the, the remaining parts of the of the of the framework. Speaking more precisely, with the Cybersecurity Act, of course, and the certification scheme that is going to be absolutely crucial. But um, to 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 summarize to summarize those uh, opening remarks, kudos to the European Commission. We do believe that uh, that uh, CRA can make a difference. Well, Gora, let me uh, turn to you, um, representing BlackBerry now. Most of us associate that with the, the phones of old, but tell us what you're working on at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Jennifer, absolutely, uh, well, first of all, to, to, to stress uh, what an absolute pleasure uh, it is to be part of this conversation today. And indeed, I, I actually wanted to start with uh, just a 10 seconds explanation of uh, what is BlackBerry, because obviously our audience, uh, you know, have been using our handheld devices for years. However, we've transitioned from that market years ago, and we are now one of the global cybersecurity software provider. So what we de essentially develop is security software for the enterprise sector and for, for governments. And uh, also we bring annex services. So, you know, like penetration testing, auditing, uh, you know, compromise assessments, uh, externalized security operations as well, especially for the enterprise sector, but also for governments, secure communications, you know, that sort of bug. So this is to understand also from what position I'm, I'm, I'm uh, coming from and uh, what is kind of uh, important for us in the context of the CRA. Well, first of all, I would start uh, in saying that the CRA is a, is, a, is a major piece of legislation that will have, a, I, I think, a very positive impact uh, on uh, the cybersecurity market in, uh, in Europe in general, because it builds up on top of what we already have as an existing legal framework. So namely, you know, the existing NIST directive and now NIST 2, which is basically under implementation phase, uh, which is focusing on incident reporting and uh, basically setting rules for critical operators, uh, but also the Cybersecurity Act, which focuses on product certification. Uh, there was probably a last big kind of a aspect that was not uh, to date yet at least covered by a commission proposal. And that was, you know, uh, how do we regulate consumer electronic devices? Uh, so, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit, uh, you know, when it comes to the technology later that has been so far quite, you know, uh, non-regulated. Now, uh, the CRA is aiming to address that, and this is something very positive. I think that, you know, if we look back in time, uh, you know, over the past few years, I think both the Mirai botnet and WannaCry were very good examples of why we need to have a kind of a horizontal, uh, you know, baseline security requirement framework uh, for all type of uh, technologies. Uh, and I think the CRA will uh, essentially, you know, uh, address that correctly. Obviously, you know, it's still a very early phase. We need to see how exactly, uh, you know, the conversations will evolve. But, you know, the, the basis are, are, are there. Uh, however, notwithstanding, you know, the, the, the great objective of the CRA, I mean, there are probably some things that we should be also mindful uh, in the development phase of this new legislation, especially when it comes to, um, you know, the alignment with uh, the existing framework, so with NIST 2 in particular, but also sectorial legislation such as DORA and others, and I'm happy to explain that uh, later on. Uh, but also with regards as well, you know, the conformity assessment procedure. So how do we achieve that in practice in terms of market practices that would not prevent or slow down the time to market of new technology, but actually make it easier and again achieve that objective of you know, having a one-stop shop uh, process that uh, allows us to be quick 
efficient and at the same time that provides that transparency that uh, Joanna and uh, Claudia were referring to. So, you know, happy to discuss on those points and uh, hear also other, other people's views. We absolutely will. I'm already seeing a flood of questions coming in very much related to some of the points you're raising. But Shanta, tell us uh, what work you're doing with the TIC Council. What's, what's the interest and in, in the perception? Yeah, so Jennifer, first of all, thanks for having us here today and putting us on the stage with these other wonderful panelists. Um, I am representing the TIC Council, so maybe just a quick moment like you, um, explaining what the TIC Council is. The TIC Council is a global association representing about 100 companies that participate and provide testing, inspection, certification, and verification services. Um, these, our member companies have locations or a presence in around 160 locations globally, and they provide conformity assessment services, both for regulatory compliance, like we're speaking to today, as well as for good practice reasons. And this is intended to protect people, the environment, and overall society as a whole, which I think we've mentioned a couple times already on the, on the stage. Um, from the standpoint of this regulation, we do see that as a valued and independent partner for all parties within these digital ecosystems, both policymakers as well as industry, we can serve with our knowledge, with our competence, with our experience, um, a very specific place in really driving and helping the success of um, this legislation. Um, from a regulation perspective, we are really happy to see that um, this, this act as it will help the market move in the right direction. And we welcome that cybersecurity is seen as an area of priority from an EU legislation perspective. When we dig into the details of the act itself, there are really three areas that touch on as being critical to us. And one is that this provides a harmonized binding set of requirements for products with digital elements, which is incredibly critical and much needed from a market, a market perspective. The second is that it sets forth requirements for mandato mandatory independent assessments for those products that are deemed as high risk. And then finally, I think um, it was spoken to earlier as well, is that life cycle piece of this, ensuring that as vulnerabilities, as products evolve over time, as new vulnerabilities enter into the marketplace, that there is that life cycle assessment that, that comes into play. So I guess in summary, um, we are incredibly supportive of the, the Cybersecurity Resiliency Act, of course, still learning, as is everyone here today. And we believe that it's going to help to level the playing field amongst manufacturers, um, enhance the security of digital products, and also help to drive consumer uptake of connected products. Well, thank you. I think we've covered a lot of ground in just our first round, but let's delve into it a bit more. Goran mentioned it. Uh, Leonardo Veneziani online here is asking, as well as others, about the potential for delays for products entering the market due to the required cybersecurity conformity assessments. Has the Commission thought about how to resolve potential administrative bottlenecks? I think, Lorena, if you could expand a bit on the assessments, why they've been framed in the way they have, and, and what you foresee as being the value of them versus potential delays? Well, I think that first of all, um, I think that it's more important to be safe than to wait some days later to get a product. I think that we will all agree on that. Uh, and that this is precisely one of the things we want to tackle is that uh, to avoid products being put on the market too quickly. So I wouldn't say delay, I would say the time necessary to have a product safe. This being said, uh, as in all type of product legislation, uh, this is not with only about, okay, I need to fulfill all these requirements. And as you know, uh, in this type of legislation, uh, we have, what we do is that then we mandate uh, the development of standards if they are not there. And this, of course, helps a lot industry. If there are standards that are already developed, things go much quicker, uh, otherwise, uh, they need to be developed, and that's what will happen. Eh? We will launch a request for, for standardization. There will be a mapping. Uh, a lot of work has already started with the radio equipment directive, because some of, of the products are already covered, and it's going to facilitate 
Uh, then uh, we have been quite uh, flexible in the way to um, uh, assess. So by default is self-assessment, which of course is something that is less burdensome for industry and that can go as quickly as they develop the internal systems to, to do self-assessment. So by default, all uh, products will need to go to self-assessment of the company. So that's going to say. But then, of course, uh, when we talk an, about critical products, then this is where we uh, ask for a third uh, conformity assessment body to, to go. Uh, and what we have done also to uh, not to revolutionize uh, the situation is that we are making use of what exists already. So we have on purpose said, OK, we are not going to create new bodies. To, uh, we have a system that is in place that works. Industry is used to it, which is the, the, the product legislation. Um, uh, and we are recycling this. So let's say that we've done as much as we could uh, to facilitate the life of, of industry in, in, in moving ahead. Yeah, Joanna. Uh, just a word on that uh, to support this stand. Um, EXO very uh, actively contributes to the discussion about the um, uh, development of the EU certification scheme. And what we are strongly uh, advocating for is to take the benefit of so-called so certification composition, where basically, I mean, it boils down to the situation when you take evidence from different uh, processes and you, you reuse it for uh, for some other uh, for some others from for some other um, processes as well and we um, promoted the same approach also in context of the um, CRA to to exactly um, to exactly take a look at the at the composition and uh, and and also make benefit out of it yeah actually that's a great point and I, I really wanted to jump on that because I think that this is what in essence will help us achieve level of efficiency mm -hmm. that we're all looking for. So uh, you mentioned, you know, this kind of, a, you know, reusability of conformity assessment methodology, you know, within the certification process. I think we need to be thinking also in the same kind of a mindset through the same parallel when it comes also to legislation, just to make sure that the interplay between what we already have under NIST 2, what we have under DORA, uh, what we will have under CRA, and what we have obviously under the new legislative framework, but also the Cybersecurity Act, all those basically pieces of requirements interlink well with each other and facilitates, again, it's about really facilitating the time to market, just not creating situations where you may have different requirements. Um, a concrete example, um, it's very interesting, like the, the incident reporting uh, methodology under the CIR, uh, CRA, uh, I find is very complete, and I think it's personally uh, very positive to have both, you know, a, re a reporting methodology for, you know, that covers all, um, all uh, actors, and that is also very kind of a time-paced, right? I mean, it's, it's aligned also with NIST 224 hours. However, what the difference between NIS and CRA and some operators will actually be recognized as both critical operators under NIST 2, but also as manufacturers under CRA, is that they'll, they'll have to report to different agencies. So under CRA, the reporting is to ENISA. Under uh, NIST 2, it's uh, to the National Competent Authority. If that service has been, or that software has been used by a financial entity, you add the financial institution under DORA. And if personal data was attached to the incident or was being processed uh, by that software, you have also to report to the DPA under GDPR. That means that for one incident, you would have to report possibly to four different authorities under four different legislations. So here, the question in terms of efficiency, because also from an operational perspective, it's very important. When I speak to my security operations guys and the legal teams, they're like, I mean, you know, those time frames would be extremely challenging. So how we can actually make sure that we can get complementarity and alignment between the different requirements. I think this is probably one of the very positive conversations we can have uh, in, the, in the months to come. Shanta, you wanted to? Yeah, maybe just to build on the comments related to the reuse and uh, the way in which you evaluate the products as well as the reuse of the legislation. One of the beautiful things about now having a framework in place and, and having a set of guidelines is that now industry and market players have something to train to. They have something to build capabilities around. They have something to build competencies around. And as you begin to know what to build, that can actually um, increase the decrease the time to market because now you know what you're driving to and what you need to accomplish. So it could actually have the counter effect. Uh, 
I'm interested to hear Bayek's view on the idea of self-assessment and a, maybe a risk-based approach, because we do know that this has, uh, has come up in other areas as well. Exactly. I mean, this is something I want to point out who listening to his very good comments, which is, um, by definition, uh, we as a consumer organization do know what self-assessment looks like, and sometimes, indeed, that is not the best experience that we've had. Um, under the CRA, you know, and don't get us wrong, I mean, this isn't, we completely understand the point of view when it comes to the manufacturers, but um, uh, our view is that indeed there are some products, and especially what I'm talking about here is consumer IoT products, that uh, unfortunately, you know, self-assessment just doesn't cut it. Um, so we understand the approach, we, we think it's a very good approach, but uh, I think this is one of the points that indeed we will need to improve, which is um, the kind of products that are actually considered as critical. Right now, the CRA proposal, uh, as well know, has a focus which uh, it's not just our opinion, it's uh, very much vehicular. It's quite a lot focused on the industrial side of this challenge. And uh, from our side, uh, we do believe there are some products that precisely because of their specific intended use, of the sensitivity of this use, uh, should also definitely be recognized as uh, critical products in need of third-party assessment. You were mentioning Kayla just uh, a while back. Well. Uh, for those of you who don't know the, the story, Kayla was uh, a, a connected doll. Uh, very nice doll, by the way. Very, very cute, very charming. Um, you know, the kids love it. Uh, but uh, there was a fundamental problem with it, which is that was fundamentally cyber unsafe. Um, our Norwegian member, the Norwegian Consumer Council, basically uh, figured out that it was easily enough to hack this doll and uh, basically control and access it from literally uh, from any point you can choose and basically gain unwanted access to a child through its uh, embedded software and hardware. We're talking about a camera, we're talking about a microphone, a speaker. Can you imagine the danger this is uh, when we're talking about products like this. So when it comes to products like children, uh, children devices, um, um, smart home systems, security, security, we were talking about smart alarm just a while ago. I mean, these are products that by nature, you know, they are made to keep us safe in the physical world, but if accessed unwantingly on the online world, that cyber risk becomes an actual risk for fun that can cause fundamental harm to an individual. So for these, these are like no-brainers that should also definitely warrant third-party assessment and you know, shouldn't just be left out for self-assessment. I mean, you wouldn't want the security system of your home uh, that's supposed to keep burglars out you know, to not to be considered as a critical event. I think this is a, a thing we can all agree on. And you wouldn't want the, the dolls that your kid plays with necessarily to be you know, just left to self-assessment, would you? So this is something that we think that there's definitely room to go along. Well, you mentioned the word risk, and I'm going to bring that up, Lorena. This will be no surprise because uh, a few people online and, and possibly in the room as well are mentioning the AI Act, and that is a, a fundamentally risk-based approach. We've talked about NIS, NIS2. We've talked about all the other various bits of legislation that have to dovetail with the new uh, CRA. What about this AI Act? What about this idea of approaching things through a risk-based formula? Okay. And can I also react? Of course. <laughs> Uh, okay, but that is how with the risk uh, assessment. Uh, I think that from the beginning uh, we started this project, we knew that we had to follow our risk-based approach. Uh, now there are two ways to follow our risk-based approach. We could uh, decide that the level of requirements would be different depending on the risk level of the product, or we could decide, which is the, the way we went, that they all have the same requirements, but uh, it's then the way you uh, assess or determine conformity that then adapts, and it's different depending on the level. Why did we go to this second approach? Um, because it's very difficult to <laughs> decide that any product on earth would not need to fulfill like uh, cybersecurity by default, by design, uh, along the, love, the, the, the life cycle, we started to see, okay, this product is maybe less risky, but could we decide that basically, because it's less risky, then it should not be ensure a, love, a, a life cycle, uh, security updates, uh, and it was simply impossible. It reminds me a lot when I was working on audiovisual in one of my previous lives, uh, and we were dealing with uh, minor protection, and we had similar debates, I mean, uh, even for uh, should SMEs uh, be, be imposed this burden, and, and at one point you say, I mean, sorry, but children need to be protected yep. <laughs> and by any 
one. Uh, so I think it's the same debate. So this is why we went through this other approach. Uh, then, of course, uh, because as I was saying before, uh, this is, these are very high level uh, principles that require standardization. In the standardization process, you can always adapt to the different type of product. So it, you, you can introduce uh, this in there. So that's uh, uh, then, of course, uh, I'm sure that we will have a lot of debates about what when, whenever you put an annex with uh, a list in a, in, a, in a piece of legislation, you know that in the legislative negotiations, this is going to be one of the things. Otherwise, it would not be fun. Um, uh, <laughs> we will have plenty of debates about what product goes where. I think that what is important is that we try to get at least a method. So that uh, is the functionality, is the use, the intended use. It's not the same it's, it's if you are using in an industrial process or, or not. Um, so I think that, that uh, we will have a lot of debates. Now, I wanted to very briefly react to some of the comments. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, I, I have the, the advantage of having in, in my team uh, the people that did the, the, the CRA, MIS2, uh, the CSA. So I, I have all the acronyms in, in, in uh in the same team. Uh, so we had this challenge of saying, OK, now we want to, as we were saying before, recycle existing product legislation to make it easier and quicker for everybody. At the same time, we had different authorities uh, for cyber. And we have tried to really uh, reach a compromise. We aligned the 24 hours, as you know. And we tried to facilitate precisely the life by saying, OK, notify to ENISA. And, and at least ENISA will then <laughs> channel. So we have really tried to, it's, it's a balance that we, we had to fight, uh, to fight, to find, sorry, we didn't fight. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, so <laughs> then for certification, yeah, thank you for pointing it. Um, it's indeed a, a very important uh, point. Uh, we struggle also on this. Uh, uh, we went to this position that, OK, we will get an empowerment to decide in certain situations uh, we may need to go up to certification. For the rest, it, there should be a presumptions of compliance if you have a. But for that, I, I fully agree that we need to make it clear that whenever we ac adopt, I say whenever, well, when we will adopt a certification scheme, because we haven't yet uh, adopted any. Eh? Uh, the, the, the first one will be the, the common criteria one. Uh, we align, of course, uh, that, and I'm sure that the day we adopt the, the common criteria uh, certification scheme, it will, we will be able to say if you comply with it, you are complying with CRA. Uh, but thanks God again, uh, it's the same uh, team working on all these things. So, uh, voila. And then for, for um, whether self-assessment is, is enough or not, um, uh, I think this is the rule. If you look at the at the um, uh, at the radio equipment directive, it, it's all it's all self-assessment. Eh? Uh, now we have been more ambitious, uh, but I think there's something that makes a big difference: is that we have enforcement measures. So if something goes wrong, uh, there are enforcement powers to uh, whether require compliance to uh, decide that this product should no longer be placed on the market to withdraw the product and even to impose fines. So I think that this is going to impose some self-discipline in the self-assessment. Okay. Shanta, I'd like to get your reaction to this and talk a little bit about these essential cybersecurity requirements, which are effectively baseline requirements. And how important do you think that is? Is that the right approach? Yeah, I mean, it, it, clearly having baseline requirements is a, is a good starting point for everything that we do. And I mentioned earlier that having those foundational requirements defined for an industry gives us something to drive for. Without having that in place, there's, um, there's no guide, there's no North Star of where are we headed, where are we going. Everyone has different perspectives and different opinions as to, to what is right. So... Um, so in general, having baseline requirements gives the market and the industry um, a, a North Star, somewhere to drive, somewhere to, um, to steer the ship, let's say, and somewhere to build capabilities, competencies, and, and really ensure that we have trained individuals and trained people available to deliver. 
Now, really quite a lot of questions. Uh, Lorraine, it will come as no surprise that they are largely directed at you, as is always the case whenever a bit of new legislation comes out. Um, let's start with a couple of basic ones. Is um, uh, How concerned is the critical energy infrastructure by the new cyber resilience law? Um, it's, uh, it's probably top of mind because of headlines and so on at yeah. the moment. Do you see uh, any uh, impact? Uh, well, I, I, I hope they are very happy uh, because uh, right now, I mean, in, and in all fields, I mean, not only energy, all fields covered by NIST too, uh, as, as you know, uh, and, and it allows me to talk about the complementarities. There we are talking about the security, the cybersecurity of the services provided by uh, important and essential entities, including uh, energy. Uh, here we are talking about products that these people use as well. So one of the novelties of, of NIST 2 is that we are imposing supply chain requirements. So we are requiring these companies to pay attention with whom they are dealing with and to take uh, into their strategy also supply chain. Now the cyber resilience is going to help them to comply with that because if I am a critical infrastructure, no matter if it's energy or whatever, and I am getting uh, supplies, whether it's software or it is whatever connected device. And I know that it has this C marking because it has fulfilled with CRA. I'm going to be more reassured about my supply chain uh, requirements. So uh, normally, I would uh, I would expect that uh, they are happy. Okay, um, and feel free, other panelists, if you want to add to jump in. Um, Daniel Cohen is asking, what is the intended purpose of the inclusion of non-embedded software? How should we understand this in the context of a proposal that's focused very much on connected devices? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the inclusion of software was, was uh, one of the first things we, we, we had to debate about because, as I was saying before, uh, most of the supply chain attacks come from vulnerabilities in the software. So uh, leaving out software was not an option <laughs> uh, for us. And we had a lot of discussions with software companies. And we, we were, we of course had been observing also what the colleagues in the US had been doing with the executive order where uh, they have uh, imposed a number of requirements on software companies precisely to avoid supply chain attacks. Uh, now, of course, it had to be uh, software as put on the market, eh? not software as a service, because then we are going into a complete different direction, which is uh, services. So I think that was the logic eh? to say, OK, uh, if you are putting a software in the market, uh, then you need to comply with these requirements, because at the end of the day, uh, this is probably what is going to help most in reducing the, the surface attack. Yeah. OK, anyone else? Uh, Joanna, would you like to add to that? Sure. I mean, maybe to the previous uh, question about the, about the benefit related to the supply chain and its security, I do believe that there is one particular element uh, included in the CRA that is worth mentioning, not only from the energy point, uh, sector point of view, but in a larger sense, uh, that can significantly boost the security posture of the, of the respective entities, and this is um, software bill of materials. Oh, yes. Uh, element that increasingly helps to uh, not only understand the, the, the composition of the software and, and the systems that, that you are basically using, but also gives a, gives a chance uh, in the future to maybe mobilize the market to deliver significant and useful automation tools that will help out to, in a, I, won't, I don't want to say and risk a statement in a real time, but in a, in a, uh, in a fast speed, uh, understand what do you exactly have within your, within your, within your organization, what are the potential vulnerabilities and how to deal with them? And I mean, like um, previously we mentioned several in incidents from the past years, but let me bring to your attention lock for j story yeah. that basically <laughs> um, uh, 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 influenced the entire uh, the, uh, the entire industry for not only for weeks but also for months and. Uh, still ongoing and uh, yeah and we will be living with that for years uh, ahead so uh, i believe that there are some elements that can significantly help to 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 make our actions more efficient and uh, and and basically more effective Go on, you're nodding there. I take it you agree. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, no, I mean, I think we all agree on, on the objectives, and I think that, you know, again, I mean, 
S bomb is a great example because, and you know, to Lorena's points actually about you know standardization and you know international convergence and technological convergence. I think that those points are very important. So uh, as the more we can achieve that within you know uh, the, the the framework of the CRA, the better. Um, uh, actually, uh, another use case, and uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of hijacking the topic here, but uh, that also is, will be very important in that process will be conformity assessment process in itself, uh, and and here something that. At least, you know, identified over those two, three days where we, we had the official uh, proposal is that, uh, um, I mean, you know, probably the next level in terms of efficiency that we can think about is to have a one-stop shop provision uh, for conformity assessment. Because currently, as Article 9 states, uh, basically, you know, any uh, authority in any member state could require technical documentation uh, related to the product in a language that they easily understand. Uh, which uh, in essence means, you know, the 23 member state languages, you know, could be required to be kind of attached to uh, all technical documentation. I mean, in terms of in terms of process, I think this is something that potentially could be a bit challenging. So probably if we have something similar to NIST 2 actually, where you have a main establishment provision for the operators and basically they report to the authority in the language of the member state where they're based, would be something that potentially could be beneficial. Uh, well, I have a, uh, somebody asking here. <laughs> yes, um, uh, we're certainly putting you through your paces today, Lorena. We're asking, somebody, asking for just a little bit more clarification. The difference between self-assessment and self-declaration of conformity. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the self-assessment is what brings you to the uh, declaration of conformity. So first you need to have the processes inside your your company to, 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 which is, by the way, why there are, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on uh, something that was said before about its self-assessment or not. Uh, some companies even prefer to go to a, a, a third-party conformity assessment body so that they don't need to uh, hire the people that maybe they don't have the resources to. So that's self-assessment. Really, you need to embed it in your process. You need to have the right people and the right competence, the right skills. So, uh, voila, and then this will bring you to allow you to have. Well, another question here that actually comes quite nicely after you mentioning one-stop shop and so on uh, is that the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, and the European Data Protection Supervisor recently sounded the alarm about lack of resources for them to do their job with regard to GDPR. Is there a risk of national and cybersecurity bodies not having resition, sufficient resources and skills? I mean, we've talked about the layers and layers of you know, checks, the balances, the requirements, the potential reporting needed. Are there bodies out there with enough bandwidth to do it? Lorena? This is for me. Well, it can be. Actually, I'm going to ask everyone to give, to give, an, give an opinion on this one. Yes, I think it's well known that we are lacking resources in the European Union. I mean, and not only in the European Union, it's, it's, it's a global problem on cybersecurity. There is a, a real lack of resources. Now, this is getting better. Uh, the figures show that little by little the, the, the skills market is adapting. Uh, we are doing a number of things in this respect. You know, we, we adopted this famous Digital Europe program where there's a whole section to finance uh, and to support member states in developing cybersecurity skills. So this is there. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, in the letter of intent of the president, uh, there was a mentioning of... Uh, I don't know how what it called, Cybersecurity Academy or something. Um, basically, pointing to actions in the field of cybersecurity skills. So, let's see what comes. Claudio, how how Happy optimistic are you? Well, uh, on, on this point, that's something we've been raising consistently, not on just on this field, but a bit of across the board actually, which is uh, our concern that uh, as the regulatory speed picks up and uh, legislation gets uh, gets approved and adopted. Uh, that um, the regulators can simply keep up with the challenges that they're now being given. Uh, I was hearing uh, Commissioner Shinas the other day on the press conference, and he was referring to this, uh, you know, brand new building that Inez is going to get in uh, <laughs> in Athens. I'm thinking, well, I, nothing against a shiny new building, but I, I think that alone uh, is not, uh, you know, doesn't cut it when it comes to uh, providing enough resources to to regulators. I mean. I, Sure, it's a figure of speech. I'm not nothing against um, nothing against that, but it does show you the, that there is a, an acknowledged need that to 
provide more resources in more, more ways and means. And um, this for us has been always a concern, and that's why every time we hear, like we're hearing from Gora, and that we should maybe refer you know, to uh, the national level, well, national regulators uh, are in a, an even more dire situation in some countries. So, um, and, and then that can raise a lot of red flags for us as consumers when it comes to you know, uh, the, um, the, effective, the eff effective enforcement, because then we, we might have enforcement bottlenecks. GDPR has shown us that. Uh, that we can have, in fact, enforcement bottlenecks showing up in particular member states. So uh, we would really like to, to avoid that. So the, the call that ANISA should have enough means, that is definitely, that's definitely in order and is definitely one of our, uh, one of our concerns. Um, just if I can make one specific note here, um, that is very, very important when it comes to the ability for consumers to get redress. And that's also something that on this proposal we find that there can be significant ways for improvement. And uh, we, we, do, we do appreciate that there's been a, a recognition of the role of enforcement, that the market surveillance authorities are in de indeed very much in power. I do agree with you on that. But um, we need uh, for uh, the redress mechanisms available for consumers also to pick up. And we need some kind of a recognition on that in the proposal that will definitely be, go a long way to address consumer concerns. And when it comes to... Um, in just one very final note, when it comes to standardization, uh, we do appreciate the, the word on standards, but um, standards are no replacement for solid, clear legislation, especially when it comes to redress and the ability to get redress from consumers. Joanna, I'd like your thoughts as well, please. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, yeah, shortage of resources is absolutely a problem, and uh, that is why we are speaking about re reusability of different elements of the, of, the, of the entire process. We are also advocating for investing in um, uh, R&D um, uh, um, uh, activities focused at developing tools that would help to automate sever certain parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the process, of the assessment process, including also uh, investing in understanding which data could be presented in machine-readable format to speed up the process and increase the efficiency. Because yes, at the end of the day, we cannot like fail because there is lack of, uh, lack of specialists, of people that can, that can be engaged in the process. Okay. Goran, please. You're, you're, you know, obviously, you will have to interact with these enforcement bodies. You've already listed them. Um, how confident are you that they are up to the job? Well, I think up very much to, to, to Lorena's point uh, and to everyone's point, actually, uh, you know, there is definitely a challenge on skills, right? I mean, and that is something that will continue. Uh, however, when it comes to, you know, interaction, well, you know, we, first of all, are used to interact with all type of regulators, be it DPAs, be it cybersecurity agencies, because, you know, it's the nature of our business, right? Probably part of the challenge will be for those new companies that will have to step into this kind of a more self-assessment world that haven't been necessarily into, oh, you know, we need to make sure that we know you know, what is kind of the checklist that is required from, uh, for, uh, from us from a security standpoint, probably for them that will be kind of a new exp uh, exploratory phase. For us, we already used to do that and we do that and I, I, I think we do that very well and very efficiently. Uh, but again, you know, it, it, there's no silver, silver bullet to that answer. Uh, the answer, probably part of the solution would be we need to invest in skills. Probably the R&D framework of the European Union can help that. So the competence center, you know, We'll have to build, build its strategic agenda for the years ahead. Probably one of the good things that we can think about is how we can make those EU funds help attract talent and retain talent in Europe. Uh, probably that's something that could be useful. And then the, the other element that I pointed out uh, uh, just previously is, again, just making sure that you, know, you, um, you avoid duplications. So, you know, again, the one-stop shop principle is as long as one entity has validated, one competent authority has validated the declaration of conformity, you know, it's, it shouldn't be, you know, a process that will have to be implemented by the 27 other national agencies. Probably this is something that will also help them triage, you know, their process and, and basically deal with fewer kind of, uh, you know, uh, risk assessment uh, processes as well. Well, I'm also seeing there a, a comment from Pia Kethofer saying, if there aren't enough resources, would it be worth considering the option of notified bodies, uh, just bearing in mind costs and so on. Uh, another comment from Whitney Clark from Sen and Senelec saying standards are not intended to replace legislation. They're a tool in support <laughs> of policy. Um, and then I'm also seeing more questions coming in, uh, perhaps alluding to the idea of exporting some of these ideas. Uh, Shante, I'd like to hear your take on everything
heard so far and, and sort of build on what we've been talking about. Yeah, it was interesting listening to the talent shortage conversation because in this industry, it's a conversation that takes place almost daily. I know um, my colleagues and I were having some conversations on this topic just yesterday. So there's no question that um, the talent shortage is real and will continue for some period of time. Ultimately, universities and educational systems will catch up and, um, and this, we won't be having this conversation every day. Um, as uh, some of my fellow speakers mentioned, technology and automation is going to be critical moving forward. The framework allows us to, to, to actually begin to see those um, become real and a possibility in the marketplace. And then I also think that this is an area where um, tick organizations or conformity assessment bodies, not necessarily notified bodies, but conformity assessment bodies can play a role. From, from all of my years of experience in this space, what I've, what I've found is that the most challenging part of building up a talent pool within an organization is that initial layer. So really getting that start, that seed for your subject matter expertise within an organization. Once you get that, it, bring, it makes it easier to bring people in with aptitude and with curiosity that you can then train and you can bring into the fold. So if you look out over the landscape and over the marketplace at the, the thousands upon thousands of manufacturers and industry participants that will need to comply if each of them is to build up their own foundation and each of them is to build up their own seed, it becomes, it puts even more of a strain on the, the talent that exists. And so again, this is a place where I think that conformity assessment can support. Shante, I want to stay with you because I have a question in from uh, Rene Summer. Uh, talking about the opportunities in the context of external relationships beyond the EU borders, uh, for example, on trade, uh, so sort of like EU Japan, the EU India, FTA, uh, TTC, the, the Technology Council, the US. What sort of opportunities are there for, if you like, exporting the ideas of the CRA? Is it something like mutual recognition of certification schemes, that sort of thing? Yeah, so, um, so in all markets, clearly, manufacturers participate in a global economy. And um, in a global economy, um, clarity of requirements, but also harmonization of requirements is, is important because it reduces the complexity that the industry participants require. Um, markets are growing up differently. Regulations, standards are all growing up differently around the globe. And it's going to be important that all of our regular, regulator, regulators, standards development organizations are talking. And um, I mean, an MOU would, would be one, one great option to, to consider in those conversations that need to take place. But talking is first, as always. Lorena, I know you're not necessarily working on international trade, but what's your view? I am uh, in the TTC uh, negotiation, so uh, I'm a little bit involved. Uh, I think that in this field, uh, we need to talk to each other, obviously. I mean, this is a global market. The hardware and software market are global markets. So uh, whatever we do here is being uh, imposed on companies that are distributing globally. So I already think that uh, the, the famous <laughs> Europe <laughs> effect uh, is going to play here. Uh, I mean, this is going to benefit the whole world, <laughs> what we are doing, because I doubt that they are going to adapt uh, their production processes to different uh, countries, or I hope they won't. Uh, so that's already something. Then I see a lot of commonality of interest to what other parts of the world are already doing in this field. I was mentioning before, um, the executive order, uh, you were mentioning the, 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 uh, the bill, uh, well, that's a bill of, of, uh, on, on, on software. So we see that there's a commonality of interest. The UK has come with a proposal, much more limited, but mm, uh, Japan is thinking about it. Uh, so I think that we are all uh, basically uh, thinking about the same. We have come the first, um, and it's always good. Uh, but then, of course, when we will be requesting uh, European standardization bodies for standards, of course, we will need to take into account what are international standards already there. We will need to talk to our colleagues about, about standards. Uh, 
uh, and I think this is something that, uh, that, that, that will be necessary. Then, of course, it was mentioned, uh, the, the regulation forces the possibility to, to, to adopt mutual recognition agreements. Uh, this is something that, that uh, is already foreseen. So uh, I think that uh, we will need to be talking to, <laughs> to each other, yes. Joanna, um, mutual recognition agreements, good idea. Uh, all of that is a good idea, but to me, basically, I, I, I mean, uh, that's again uh, kind of my personal view, but I think that CRA can gives us this possibility to, to create a competitive, European competitive uh, advantage on the global market and uh, achieve a similar effect as it was with GDPR. At the beginning, everyone was a little bit hesitant. Okay, we will have all those uh, privacy-oriented rules. How we're gonna, you know, like comply with that on a global market? And then we saw that uh, all of uh, other markets, including American, they started to implement very similar rules and play by the same by the by the same rules uh, as Europeans. For me, this is a chance to actually, as I said, boost the security level globally. And, and also make that as a competitive advantage to say, okay, these are uh, products that meet European standards and these are, uh, I don't wanna say stri stringent standards because it's not maybe the correct word, but these are standards that are important from the point of view of, of, uh, of, of the security as such. So uh, to me, it's a hu huge potential and possibility. Okay, Lorena, again, we have questions. <laughs> The C mark is going to become really the security. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, when the commission comes out with something new, there's always questions. Why did you do this and not this or that instead? But we do have a question asking, why did you not perhaps propose uh, a product liability extended directive to cybersecurity? Oh my God. Okay. Um, just as a, as a as a no, point. But I can also yeah. Okay. Let's go with that, that one. For the Let's go with that one. Okay. This proposal is not about liability, okay? Uh, the product liability uh, proposal is complementary to this. So one thing is that a manufacturer or, or a developer needs to respect a number of requirements, and that's what we are doing, and then they will be responsible for those requirements to be respected. A completely different thing, which is related, is whether who should be liable if something, wrong, if something goes wrong. And we come to the redress and all that. If I am a citizen and I suffer something, who is going to be liable? That's a different set of rules. The liability rules and the uh, product requirement rules. But of course, if we have the Cyber Resilience Act, it's going to help on liability. Because if I am a manufacturer, something goes wrong, and I can say, but wait, I was really respecting all the CRA. I'm sure this is going to, to uh, help, in that case, that manufacturer in the liability procedures. But uh, let's say that these are two different things. I know they are often mixed, and we had to go through that in the legislative process when we were uh, creating these. But they are fully compatible, the, the project liability and awards for that. I don't know if I was pedagogic enough to explain it. But. So another one, Lorena, for you again. Actually, I'll bring well, two together. Like, it's more <laughs> like when I, when I pass the, the impact assessment board, you know, uh, it's like, woo, woo, woo. OK, let's see if I pass this one. <laughs> <laughs> How have the technical specifications been incorporated into the new act? Will it resemble the text of the machinery directive? <laughs> and another one is, will the EU common criteria for cybersecurity be applied to support the new legislation? OK. So on the first one, listen, I mean, they, they, whomever has asked the question, they can look at it and see and compare. Of course, we, 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 we got inspiration uh, from that. We have been very much in contact with the colleagues. Uh, uh, now it's not the same. Eh? But uh, uh, now I, I already answered before to, 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 to the common criteria. Uh, I think that uh, because we are still, I mean, we are at the late stages of the process. And normally, uh, the way it is being prepared it should facilitate, let's say that if you comply with the common criteria certification scheme, normally there should be a presumption of compliance with the Cyber Resilience Act. That's the way we are trying to build it. Let's hope we manage. And that's what, what it says also, like that certification scheme will serve that purpose, like that if they cover the same criteria uh, and, and the way we are doing it is so that the same criteria are covered. Then there will be more, but at least the basic ones of CRA should be should be in. Okay, and, and Lorena, the last one. I'm going to ask others to answer this one as well. The last one directed totally at you. It's Alex Fontaine is asking, aren't the Data Act 
and the Cyber Resilience Act incompatible in their approaches of sharing by design versus safety by design to their approach on, on Internet of Things data, especially regarding third party sharing and long life use. Um, oh my God. I think it's it's quite it's, it's a political question, I, really. I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I think the the, if the aim the the point that they're trying to make is that increased data sharing may increase in vulnerabilities is is the potential. Ah, okay. Mm. Yeah, but we are not going to stop data sharing because maybe there could be, I mean, we need to do data sharing in a secure way. And if we have secure connected device, this is going to help uh, that data sharing happens properly. I mean, that's the link I can find, but maybe I'm missing something, yeah. I'm going to actually build on that a little bit, um, Claudio, and ask you about your thoughts about uh, the trust element required for consumers to trust that manufacturers really do have their best interest at heart and that they are not, for example, hiding vulnerabilities or hiding exploits because of their, their brand. Yeah, of course, and that's a fundamental point. This is, in the end, it's all about trust and um, consumers have a reasonable expectation that uh, the products they buy are indeed um, secure and safe. And uh, what unfortunately is the case right now uh, is that this is not happening. This is simply not happening. So this legislation will indeed go a long way to tackle this issue. And um, when it comes to the introduction of these mandatory minimum cybersecurity requirements, I mean, this is fundamental. You were just talking about the, the idea of uh, the data sharing. Uh, so much data is now shared and exposed. I mean, this proposal does go a long way with these, um, with this, we're talking about something like when it comes to encryption of data, when it talks about strong authentication mechanisms, I mean, when these things are already required by default, uh, this goes a long way to help uh, to stop the increasing exposure of, um, of consumers on the digital world because indeed we are very much connected these days and the products are increasingly uh, interconnected, but the more connected we are, the more vulnerable we are and more vulnerable because we are more exposed. So this is something that is very, very important. Um, however, when it comes to consumers, to have this trust, it doesn't just stop. Up, it's not just an upstream issue; it needs to go all the way downstream. And that's why, when it comes to to redress, it's so fundamental that consumers have very clear redress mechanisms. I'm circling back to this point because, uh, coming back to the Product Liability Directive, we, we do understand the point. But however, we've seen with other legislation, very recent one actually, uh, when it comes to DSA, DMA, that. Uh, we were able to go further and uh, we were able to establish special compensation mechanisms for consumers already within the specific legislation and uh, we were able to uh, understand that it's helpful for not just consumers to have their voices heard but also to uh, support collective redress and to allow them to, you know, especially consumers which are more vulnerable, do not have the means to uh, take it upon their own hands, to rely on, uh, on organizations, especially consumer organizations, to carry on the banner for them. And that's why uh, something that the proposal for us would be important is that just like the DSA and DMA, that they're added to the annex of the Representative Actions Directive, for instance. So these are very small steps that, indeed, the proposal is very, very solid, it's very, very important for, for us as, cons as consumer advocates. But indeed, there are some rules which can be made for it to go, you know, fully, you know, uh, to, which fully to achieve its purpose and, and to go the full mile. So this is something we can definitely build on and uh, we can definitely achieve a lot more legislation for, for the protection of uh, consumers. Goran, let me ask you, do you think uh, with this new proposal we are going to see a change, a fundamental change in mindset around the idea of cybersecurity? and indeed cyber resilience. We haven't talked a lot about the more esoteric idea of whether they're two different things and how they dovetail. But just as a sort of last round of questions, give me your thoughts on that. I certainly hope so. And I think that's actually uh, uh, definitely achievable. And I think that the CRA uh, kind of fundamentals are really focused into making that reality happen. And I hope that, of course, I mean, that, that, will, be, that will be the case. But I think, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, I mean, we need to be uh, mindful of the reality in which we live today, right? Uh, and I think, you know, Claudio, I mean, spoke extensively on that, is that, you know, you have some, uh, you, know, uh, in, you know, for some type of uh, products or sectors or, you know, just some individual undertakings do not necessarily have the level of maturity 
uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, then you know, because again, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from a position of, you know, uh, a representative of a cybersecurity company. I mean, we're cyber freaks, right? I mean, all we do, you know, day in day out, is think about how we secure our customers' data, our customers' networks, their endpoints, and so on. Uh, and you know, for us, this is this is the fundamental of the business. Uh, you know, we discussed previously about third-party conformity assessment. I mean, this is something that we do on a daily basis because you know our customers would require it because also it would uh, allow us to get an external check on top of our internal you know self assessment but let's say you know it, it, it's part of our fundamental uh, business uh, so therefore you know would never undermine you know the security posture of a potential product or a service however again we need to be mindful it's not necessarily the case for all type of product so again I think that the rules that the commission has uh, presented will actually help us get to that direction. And I think Lorena had a great point. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about enforcement. You know, the one big thing that will change for some of the manufacturers is that if they haven't been doing it so far, it would be, oh, you know, uh, basically a slap on the wrist. And, you know, you've been very naughty. While now, you know, you have penalties, you have san sanctions, the product can be pulled out from the market. So it's definitely, you know, a next generation uh, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, enforcement and compliance. Uh, and actually, you know, this is the GDPR example, you know, that gets repeated into a new, basically, uh, market layer. So yes. that's, that's positive. Deja vu. Shante, um, a final thought from you. What is going to be the impact of the CRA? What are you hoping to see in the next coming weeks and months? Yeah, I think... Um I think it's, um, it's a great question. And earlier it was mentioned this trust aspect. And um, bad actors in, a, in an industry aren't always purposeful bad actors. Sometimes it's, it's accidental and it's because of a lack of awareness. So what the CRA does um, create is this atmosphere of visibility, this atmosphere of, of understanding and an atmosphere of awareness. And so, um, so while there's many things that we'll see as we begin to get our, our arms around standardization and, and compliance and evaluations, the most immediate thing I believe that we're going to see is just what we're trying to provide here today, awareness and understanding. Well, thank you. Lorena, I will give a final word to you because you've been quizzed to death. So if you can tell us your optimistic and outward looking approach. Honestly, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting because this proposal has come at the same time as many other things. And there are many things going on right now in the world, uh, unfortunately, not all very positive. So with my team, we were saying, well, it's going a bit unnoticed. <laughs> and um, I believe that the impact of this uh, legislative proposal is huge, huge. Going unnoticed, and maybe it's better, uh, but it's huge. Uh, because as we were saying before, it will have a global impact. This is not an impact only in the European Union. This is going to change the rules of the game globally, one way or another, because they will copy us or because they will not have the choice by, to abide by uh, our rules. And this is good not only for the level of cybersecurity of this world, but for the competitiveness of, of Europe, as very rightly, rightly put. And then I fully agree with that. This, this will change the man mindset not only of industry, that is not paying sufficient attention, not all, that you have best in class as well, but not paying sufficient attention to this uh, because they were not bearing any cost, but precisely because now citizens will be aware of the risk they were having. Right now, they don't even know they're at risk. They don't even know. So this is going to change the overall mindset of industry because consumers now will be much more exigent. And I leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lorena. We will be watching. Thank you very much to those of you in the room who joined us today. And for all your questions, I am sorry we couldn't get to so many of them. But bear in mind that this is the beginning of the conversation on this piece of legislation, not the end. Remember to keep following your active online and use the hashtag EA Debates to find out more about the big discussions we'll be having coming up in the very near future.